I'm Vicki Colvin, and welcome to Instrumental Analysis. In this third lecture of week six, I'm going to be talking about liquid chromatography instrumentation, giving you kind of an overview of what the block diagram looks like, and then starting to go through it step by step, uh, beginning with both the solvents and the liquid handling systems generally, the most important of which is what you do to get the really high pressures that are the hallmark of liquid chromatography. So the magic box we're talking about this time is a system where, like all others, you inject a sample, except this time you're going to be getting a chromatogram. We've talked a lot about that. It's got time on one axis and signal on another. And you're going to get a series of peaks, which you're going to be able to identify, perhaps if you have an LC mass spec, which is a very cutting edge instrument, you could do it that way. Or you can use other means we'll talk about more when we get to the detection. Nevertheless, it's both an example of separation and detection of analytes, and it's incredibly powerful because of the wide range of molecules that can be studied with liquid chromatography. So you want to try to diagram the instrument, understand the different choices you make at each stage. What kind of column do you use? Why does that matter? What kind of detector is best for the problem at hand? And that's really what I want you to be able to do when you think about liquid chromatography systems. Here's a picture of an LC system. It's usually stacked components, and depending on what pieces you want to buy, you'll get kind of a different stack. So it's kind of like building a really big deli sandwich. You can get, you know, two types of meat and a slice of cheese, and that will all be determined by the nature of your separation. But most of what it is, is actually materials and, and components that handle the mobile phase, which is a bunch of liquid. So up at the top of this instrument, you'll see more clearly in a second, is a whole bunch of containers of mobile phases. And those have to get pumped through the system. They end up going into a column, which is where the guts of the separation process occur. And finally, you detect what comes off of the column with a detector. Here's just another view of what I just showed you, a little bit more detail. So you can see a bunch of solvents at the top, and there'll be different types of solvents. They need to be degassed, so they should have no bubbles. And in most cases, you don't want any water in the solvents. There's usually a binary pump. What binary means, we'll talk about pumps more in this lecture, is simply a pump that pumps two different types of liquids and then lets you mix them together. Then that mobile phase goes and runs through a column that in which you've injected some of the sample, and then you can see it in the detector. So that's kind of the way that this pans out when you see an LC system, is it starts at the top of the mobile phases and then they get pumped through the columns which are usually near the bottom. Let's start with sample injection. This is actually a lot simpler than a gas chromatography system. This is a case where LC has got a simpler instrumental design than a gas chromatography system. So you're going to load your sample with a syringe. And in this case, you're going to be loading 10 microliters up to hundreds of microliters. And one of the challenges in an LC system is that you've got a mobile phase that's moving under pressure, and it's moving really fast. So you can't stop the flow, inject your sample, and turn on the flow. The flow is always going. Okay, it's always going by. And so what you do is you fill up a loop with your sample, you stop, and then the system opens and closes to let that material join the mobile phase. So there's usually something called a loop in the sample injection system, and that's where your sample sits before you actually rotate a knob and you inject it into your stream. And this is an example of what one looks like. Uh, if you're doing NLC, it's got this black knob, and you turn it one way or turn it another to inject your sample. Now, HPLC solvents are another really important component of the instrument, and they're very finicky and extremely expensive. So one of the reasons you like to do short chromatography experiments that don't last an hour is because it costs you a lot, lot less in waste solvent. So you'll notice that these solvents need to be highly pure, which of course contributes to their cost. And these are just two examples of acetonitrile, a kind of go-to HPLC solvent to really get HPLC grade. The other thing you'll notice about the boxes are the funny straws coming out of them and the fact that they have lids on them. And that's really because they need to be degassed. These solvents cannot have any bubbles because a bubble has a different compressibility than the rest of the liquid. And it can cause a change in pressure, and it can also cause a, a weird signal out at the detector. So you really don't want any bubbles in your system, so you generally degas. The other thing you also don't want is any oxygen and you don't want any water. So handling those solvents and changing them can be a bit of a hassle. And the other thing you'll notice is up at the top, you don't just have one big vat of mobile phase. It's not like when you run gas chromatography and you, you haul up a thing of nitrogen or a thing of helium, and that's your mobile phase in that big tank. What happens here is you might be mixing different mobile phases, or really during the methodology and the optimization, really changing around what your mobile phase composition looks like. So often up 
at the very top of an HPLC system, you'll find five or six different kinds of solvents, all of which can be plumbed into the system to give you just the right custom mix you need to get the best separation possible. Another really important thing to realize about LC systems is they operate under high pressure. So shown here is a typical fire hose that some brave firefighters might be using. And the pressure in that thing is 1,200 PSI. And look how big, how big that thing is. Imagine taking that same pressure, but it's in a much, much, much narrower, smaller bore. And that's really what's going on in HPLC. You're going to have to have pumps that can produce that kind of pressure in a really relatively contained laboratory system. So the pressures that you need to get to are up to 1,200 bar. And as you can see, that's a lot more than what these firefighters are operating at. And it's interesting how HPLC pumps work. First of all, they're all going to be stainless steel. Most plastic materials can't withstand those kinds of pressures without cracking or breaking. So one of the features of an LC system is a lot of expensive stainless steel machine parts that fit together to make sure that all of the sort of liquid handling system is contiguous and you don't have any leaks. And the bane of your existence when you do liquid chromatography, believe me, is leaks. Because once some of that mobile phase starts coming out, your pressure isn't what you want it to be, you're leaking fluid, it's a mess, and you got to go figure out where the leak is and fix it. Now, how the pressure is generated is kind of interesting, and I want to take you to a website that gets you kind of just started on it. So, right up here at the top, you can type in that website yourself and read it. This is a really nice discussion of HPLC pumps, and it's kind of interesting to know how they work. It's basically a standard pump. There's a motor that drives a piston, and that piston has to be a sapphire piston because of the kinds of pressures that are put on it. Sapphire is one of the best materials to use, and in fact, contributes to some of the greatest expense in a modern high pressure liquid chromatography system. So here you see it operational. It's kind of fun to watch. When it's pink, it's sharing the fluid with the system. And when it's blue, it's building up pressure. And so one of the challenges when you use these sorts of single piston pumps is you're going to get kind of a wave effect, right? You're going to have a high pressure wave and then a lower pressure and then a high pressure wave and then a lower pressure. And that's problematic. And you can kind of see a picture of that here where you can see you're going to have a different kind of flow rate when you have the delivery of the pressure as opposed to when you're taking in and building up that pressure. A lot of systems will work it by having a tandem piston, piston pump shown here in which two different pistons kind of operate to offset that kind of um, change in flow. And you can also use dampers. Dampers are really interesting systems because they're kind of like flexible straws. And if the pressure gets too high, they bulge. <laughs> and it brings it back down. So if you have the right kind of damper in a system, you can actually kind of hopefully smooth out some of these little pressure variations that you get by using these pumps. So I hope that had that pump discussion was kind of interesting. It's not generally something that we think about when we are using an HPLC as chemists, but a lot of times if you're troubleshooting problems in an HPLC, it's surprising how frequently those problems arise in the pumping system. You have to take it apart and put it back together. So having at least some idea of what it looks like can be useful. So here are just some conditions that you might see on HPLC. Um, sort of a standard HPLC might be 50 to 350 bars, which is, you know, fire hose or a little bit more. But if you go to ultra HPLC, which is going to give you much higher resolution and faster separations, really what you're paying for is a system that can really deliver those much, much, much higher pressures in a way that's very smooth. So they spend a lot on the dampers and the pump design so that you can achieve those pressures without any fluctuations in flow rate. So that, so that pretty much sums it up for what you find in LC instrumentation kind of at a high level. We've talked a little bit about the solvents you need. They have to be pretty pure. They have to be degassed. And in many cases, they can't contain any water, so you leave those caps on top. The other thing that we talked about were the pressures that you have to reach in the system, and a little bit about the pumps that one might find. Thanks so much. I'll see you next time.